obviously you've got a little bit of a checkered past and yes. I've suffered uh, a horrible tragedy at some point as well. Yes. Uh, but that's go right to the very beginning. So where did you grow up? I uh, grew up in West Midlands, Birmingham, Solio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a um, pretty normal um, normal childhood growing up um, until about the age of eight, nine. Uh, I had a stepdad who was pretty violent, abusive to me and my sister. So like, <clears throat> every day I get beaten, I get thrown down the stairs a couple of times. Um, yeah, it's a bit of an arsehole. Mm. So that went on for a good few years, probably about the age of 14, 15. Uh, hence why I started boxing. Like, um, sick of getting beaten up and thrown around by an old, older bloke. Mm. So yeah, that was, um, that was pretty shit, but brought me to wherever my, where I am now, I suppose. Yeah. And, you know, was that, was that something that you sort of spoke to your mum about? Like, was she aware? Like um, see, the thing with my mum, she's, um, she, I don't know how to put it, but yeah. Anyway, my mum's a mum's a she's a, a different character. Mm. So um, yeah, she was she was aware of sorry the, aware of, of what was going on. Um, she she'd seen it. She was a. Uh, well, she used to see it. Yeah, she's seen it. Yeah. Was your was your stepdad quite abusive to your mother as well? Um, not physically, but emotionally. Yeah. yeah. Like he's um, he definitely got in her head. Mm. Definitely got in her head. Um, hence why she thought oh. Well, I don't think she thought it was normal, but I didn't think she anything because she didn't want to upset the fact that she had a comfortable life. You know, we had, we had nice things. He, he was a pretty successful bloke. He had a few car garages and, you know, I think he was like one of the first blokes in the UK to open up car washes and stuff. So that was like a big craze back then. So we had a bit of, uh, <clears throat> he had a bit of money. He had a couple of fireworks shops as well. Like, so across the year, so he's, we had a nice house, a nice life. And I don't think my mum wanted to dis, disrupt all that, probably more for her sake than ours, because it was mm. easier thing to do. Yeah. It's fucking mental, isn't it? And then was it just you and your sister? Yeah, me and my sister. I do, I do have a brother as well. He's um, from my mum's first marriage with, with my, my father. Yeah. Uh, his name's Adrian. He um, lives in the down south. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he's, uh, I think he's nearly 40 now. I think he's 40. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So he wasn't in the house at the time when this No, he wasn't in the house at the time. He was, uh, I think he was in the, in the army at the time. And then as like a, as a sort of young lad, eight-year-old, up to your teens when you started boxing, like where, where was your head at in regard to getting into boxing? So you said that you didn't want to obviously take the shots from like an older guy anymore like was the plan to to train up and lay him out at some point yeah it was, it was of course it was it's <laughs> a, oh, yeah but I envisioned it all the time giving him, him a smack and that but um, by the time I actually became good at boxing like it, it, they, they were over right um, but yeah I mean like I was also quite a fat kid as well mm -hmm. so uh, I used to get like picked on at school and stuff you know the, and things like you fat and all this and stuff so um, yeah, yeah I started boxing in Wolverhampton with um well, he's a good thing. He's cruiserweight champion. Um, fought Tim Weatherspoon. His name's Nigel Rafferty. So uh, yeah, in Wolverhampton, I used to go there every, every day after work, um, and be me and him, a few others, and we'd train constantly. And I'd yeah, train with him for about a good two years. He's um, he's, he was a good mentor, mate, really good mentor, and he's uh, I kind of looked up to him as well. He's um, very he's got a very big presence about him. He's a as he's a cruiserweight, so he's a big lump. Mm. Um, he, had a, he had a door firm, which is quite big over there, and yeah, he was um, he guided me in the in the correct way. Yeah, and and did you uh, you mention your your sort of biological father a second ago? Mm. Did you have any contact with him growing up? Um, I didn't meet my dad until I was about ten years old for the first time. So, um, growing up, I thought my stepdad was my dad. Right. But um, my sister, I was, she's um, my sister thinks she's four years older than me. So um, my sister did know who my dad was. So she was, you know, she was unkindly made to keep that secret from me for however many years, which is not a very nice thing to put on on, on a young girl that she can talk about her dad with her own brother. But yeah, so um, <clears throat> my, my dad, he's, um, he lives in Nottingham. Um, I don't really speak to my dad. To me, I, I did have quite a lot to do with him, but like um, I found out quite a few things which, you know, which I, I didn't really like about him, but at the end of the day, they're not his fault. Um, he suffered with quite a bit of mental health. He's been sectioned two, three, four times. He um, actually kidnapped me as a kid and uh, barricaded himself in the house with a shotgun. Literally, I was about a fucking month old. Okay. And so, yeah, so um, left me behind the sofa and kind of, I don't know if it got to like a shootout with the police, but all I know is I got out and that's um, my, my granddad actually got me out. And he was, um, my granddad was another you know, big, big support in my life and a father figure as well as, well as my uncle. Mm -hmm. So like my, my uncle and my granddad raised me, really. But it was at the same time, like I, I'd never told them what me and my sister were going through because, you know, I thought it was normal. I didn't, 
Like, you, you're a kid, you don't really know, do you? Obviously, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't think I, was, you know, I had to tell anybody about it. Mm. And obviously, in the boxing gym, like you said, you, you kind of, I guess, acquired like a bit of a mentor and a father figure yeah. or a sort of male role model yeah. through doing that. Was it something you ever spoke to them about? Um, no, I didn't because, you know, uh, as, you, as you're getting up and you get into these sort of gyms, you come across alpha males and you don't want to seem seem weak. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's not embarrassing, but I suppose when you're a young lad growing up, it kind of could be seen as embarrassing. So like you kind of zip your lip, if you like to say. Um, yeah, just go there, do your thing. But it's um, it's not something I've really, really spoken about till I became a bit older because I realise now to move on from your past, you have to, you know, speak about things, which is why I'm so open with my life um, to be able to in order to you know pass and progress in the future yeah yeah 100% and I'm just thinking about obviously you know the there's going to be a, a ton of of people and you know sort of even kids right now that would be experiencing sort of abusive sort of domestic situations yeah like thinking back now, now you can reflect and, you know, and have that mature head on the situation. Like what, what would you have told yourself as like a, a sort of 10 year old now to, to try and maybe improve that situation? Um, I definitely say speak up about it. If you can't tell somebody in your family, obviously you're at school, tell a teacher. Um, there's all sorts of places like Childline and, and things like that, which I'm sure people can contact as well. But definitely, definitely don't sit in that situation because it's not good for you. Yeah. Definitely speak up about it. And then Solihull as, as an area. So obviously Birmingham is one mm. of the biggest cities in the UK. Um, and naturally in a big city, you're going to have very affluent, nice areas. But yes. of course, you're going to have very deprived areas. Yes, yeah, definitely, definitely. Where did where did Solihull sit on that continuum? So Solihull, luckily enough, is a nice area. Okay. I don't know so much now, <laughs> but it's it's the, probably the, the nicest area in the surrounding of like maybe Birmingham or clusters Birmingham, do you know what I mean? Um but yeah, I was, I, was, I was pretty lucky for that. I mean, then as I got a bit older, then I started moving to the more deprived areas as my mum became, became single. Okay. Um, like, yeah, not, not council estates and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, the not, not ideal to grow up in, but like, people have no choice. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back from Solihull, which is a nice area, and then going to, you know, going to, like, council, and it's kind of a, a shock, do you know what I mean? It's like... A, what mum is this, is this our house she's like yeah because I remember I remember saying that actually because we've gone from a big house in a place called Earlswood which is really really nice area big houses with it and then we've come to this shoebox I'm like mum is this is this where we live and she's like, it's like yeah I'm like okay and I was like I, just, I couldn't comprehend that you go from that to that yeah, it's, it's funny you say that because we've we've talked a few times because Danny and I grew up in council estates in, yeah. in locally and you know so where I grew up was a very deprived area certainly for the time that I was growing up there and I've said before that the the kind of saving grace for me I think in in part was my ignorance yes. that you know this was before social media and everything else so I had no idea how other people lived. Yeah. I thought everybody was poor. Everybody just lived in that way. Like, you know, we go out stone fighting and, and play and chase or whatever we used to do as kids as entertainment. Yeah. You know, I mean, I had to choose between, I think, like like Sky One and Alton Towers at one point growing up. And that was fine. You know what I mean? It was no problem. But I always thought that if I knew what the other half like lived like, mm. it would have been far more difficult. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss, isn't it? Yeah. And also, obviously, the people, you know, the sort of other kids in deprived areas, you know, certainly those that have... Um, you know, lived there all their lives and second, third generation in that area. Certainly in my experience, and obviously time's moved on, but, you know, if anybody was remotely different and, you know, not from the area, spoke a different way, looked a different way, they'd be absolutely targeted, yeah, yeah, of course. you know, for, for all sorts of horrible things. Did you experience much of that? Yeah, I mean, like, going from, you know, like a, a small little primary school and it was, it was just literally one class in each in each year, like much about 20 kids, all not well off and that, but you know, they're all, all like from, let's say, middle class to middle class. class. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> then I've gone to like, then I've gone to my secondary school and that's like borderline council estate and, and, and I'm like, oh. and obviously I said earlier, I was a fat kid. So obviously that and that and speaking, you know, not, not posh, but like not the same accent that they did. I had a massive target on my back. I was like, oh, fucking hell, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the advantage is you, you've done a bit of boxing at this point. Yes, yes. So as much as, you know, doing a combat sport is very different to fighting in the street, as, as yeah, I'm sure we can all appreciate. Um, and, you know, sadly, not that this is a positive in any way, but obviously you've suffered some violence. So you aren't completely alien to someone yeah, being aggressive towards you. 
So how did you respond to like, what was the, the, the first interaction that you can recall that was maybe negative when you moved into that deprived area? Yeah, so I think, oh, I remember his name, but I won't say. Um, yeah, he's a ginger kid. Um, Had to be ginger, didn't he? Yeah, I was just saying. So like he said something to me and I called him ginger back, which he didn't like. And then I got punched in the face and I just stood there and I was like, do I hit him back? And like, because obviously like, I thought, mm. I didn't hit him back, which I'm really annoyed about still to this day. <laughs> but yeah, um, that was the first thing. And I think that was, yeah, it's probably, what are you in year seven, about 11, 12? Mm, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, it was in year seven. And I, everyone was expecting a big fight. And I was like, I just walked off and I had my first black eye. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. But it wasn't <laughs> cool. <laughs> and how long have you been boxing for at this point? Um, not long. So I think maybe... So on and off, maybe probably about a year. Something like okay. That. And... I mean, we didn't really sort of continue sort of the boxing chat, but we'll circle back to it. But I mean, at this point, you know, when, when you say you've been boxing for about a year, where would you rate your ability at that point? Oh, no, it was, it was literally just, you know, give myself some self-confidence, yeah. get a bit of that, the chub off. Okay. And, you know, just like, yeah, I'd say like have some confidence in me. But yeah. at the same time, like, I wasn't like that guy who wanted to jump in and give someone a dig back. I was yeah. very mellow kid and, you know, kind of, not, I'd say shy as well. Um, but I didn't like confrontation. I still don't like confrontation now, but I didn't like confrontation. So I thought, you know, just, just do one. Yeah, and this is the thing, isn't it? Again, like people have their, you know, sort of judgments around combat sports and boxing and stuff. Yeah. But hitting someone back in a controlled sport versus doing it in the street is very different. And I know even, like I said, I grew up in a deprived area, but my parents weren't from that area. Yeah. So they were, you know, good people. Um, and you're not saying people in deprived areas aren't good people, but, you know, so you know they they didn't have a lot of they were quite naive to you know the local surroundings shall we say mm -hmm. and i was always raised in a way where you know you shouldn't hit people yes under any circumstances violence is bad was you yeah yeah, oh, was yeah. And, and, and mate i was in the exact same situation as jay so many times where i got a dig off someone and i was a bit like oh i'm not allowed to hit them because i'll get in trouble off my parents yeah, right. and it took me a, took me a few cracks to to figure out that actually i don't have much of a choice in this matter yeah, yeah of course how about that sort of transition for you though? Like, when did you, you know, did the the kind of bullying or the, the sort of the targeting continue? And was there a point where you realised that you actually had to fight back? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, going through year seven and I, it's, um, I always start going through your adolescence period, testosterone hits up and, you know, everyone's like, oh, who's the hardest kid in school and, and whatever. And there's always, there's always those that, that either, you know, the group, which there's always that one group that just think, you know, they're, they're like the bad boys of the year and stuff like that. And I wasn't ever, you know, in that. And then obviously, you know, still getting picked on. I was still a little bit chubby and stuff. And then, yeah, I, did, I think it was after about a year after that first punch, like it didn't happen like regularly. Do you know what I mean? It probably happened maybe one more time after that. And then I remember like, yeah, I got into a fight and then I got suspended from school. Then I did get in trouble. So then I got my TV taken off me and my PS2. Couldn't play Grand Theft Auto and stuff like oh, that. Oh, so. man, fucking San Andreas. San Andreas back in the day. That's it's so good. Yeah, it's good, so man. Good. Yeah. So this is the thing, isn't it? Like, you get in a fight because you potentially defend yourself getting in trouble. Yes. And, it, yeah, it can be quite confusing. Mm. And then did you continue boxing, like, locally or...? No, so um, it wasn't until I, um, I started MMA. Um, I actually went back to him for, to help with my stand-up for my very first fight, which was over in Leeds. Mm. So uh, my first MMA gym was in Solihull area, and that was, uh, you heard of a gentleman called Chris Rice? He's an old cage rage champion. So he was um, he was the head MMA coach. Uh, Braulio Estima had the um, jiu jitsu downstairs. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, knew Braulio since I was probably well. I met him the first time. I was probably about nineteen, twenty. Okay. And yeah. So uh, between the two of them, everyone like became really good fighters out there. Mm. And then um, yeah, loads of great fighters. Which all when that closed, all transitioned over to Renegade, which obviously Leon Edwards, big gym over in Birmingham, which I've also trained at. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so that's when I went back to boxing was my first fight, which was over in Leeds, mm -hmm. uh, four months clubs, mm -hmm. age of 19, 20. Weight cut was stupid. Just literally um, drove up there with my uncle in my corner and and just fought, just got my shoulder, got head kicked, carried on. Um, yeah, ended up knocking his bottom teeth out. And then he just saw that my shoulder, I couldn't defend. So I got another head kick and got knocked out. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it a good fight. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, it's good, man. So just going back a couple of steps then. So so when you, did you make the decision to, to start MMA training? Was this while at school or had you left school? No, so I left school at that point. Okay, fine. Yeah. So just before we kind of close that chapter of your life, I mean, 
you obviously had the you know the the, the, the crack of the ginger cake and then you had this fight with uh, you got your TV loss was there any uh, anything else sort of growing up that um, stands out in regard to you know sort of fighting or, or anything um, no I didn't experience a lot of that bar home yeah. yeah so the most most violence was at home yeah okay and how about your sort of academic credentials did you do well at school no I got, exp- I got expelled from school okay what for um, I don't remember what it was I think it was like a collection of things um so basically, when I got expelled, it's when um, my grandma passed away. He had cancer, he had bowel cancer, and then just watching, it's a really big like influence in my life. Mm-hmm. And watching, he's a strong man, strong character, and then just watching my granddad die slowly. You know, I mean, you're a kid, you're confused, you don't know what to think. Um, so that had a bit of an effect on me. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't call it, you know, going off the rails or probably a bit of a reb- rebellious stage. Um, yeah. So then I started acting up at school. So it's just vandalism and then having. I don't know what it was, and like everyone like had like um you know like a stupid dog pile on the playing rugby on the field and stuff like that. And some kid got his leg broken, and then he made it out that it was you know all intentional. So then we all got suspended, and then I think it was then another argument. Then I got expelled, and I got sent to a pupil referral unit, which is where I learned bricklaying, plastering, painting, which is probably the best thing for me because I was pretty shit at school anyway. Mm. So yeah, I learned quite a lot of valuable skills over you know, that way. So in, in one way, it's a good thing, but. I mean, I didn't get any GCSEs or, or anything like that, but being in a building trade right now, like, I probably wouldn't use them anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, so I left, left it was called Archway Academy, based over by the Blues Ground, which was in a kind of rough area, so travelling over there, having to get two buses in the morning, you know, <laughs> seeing everyone's at the back of the bus playing their old polyphonic ringtones and... Yeah, going for it is a, a rough area, rough, rough lads there, but they're, they're all nice people, do you know what I mean? Mm. All good lads. And uh, yeah, so I left there with um, two Brit Lane MVQs, mm. painting and decorating certificates, and a bit of plastering and stuff like that. So that was my bridge to where I am today, like building and contracting, but I did more groundwork and stuff now, mm. uh, machine driving and things like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was probably the best outcome of a bad situation for me, really. So I kind of look at it in a positive light. Mm-hmm. So you've done a bit of boxing, yeah. you're now sort of out in the, the big wide world as an adult, um, and then obviously you find your way into MMA. What was the what was the kind of inspiration for, for getting involved with mixed martial arts? Well, I used to have um, to get to college, I used to get myself, my, my granddad bought me a moped, um, and it was it was in the garage for me for when I passed. So like, it was, um, like it was a big thing for me to, you know, be able to go out and drive and stuff like that and get to college and things like that. So I was uh, I came to a roundabout and there was these little signposts and it was called Sprawl and Brawl and it's like MMA here and it was like, I, was like, oh, shit, I want to do that. And then I got to another set of traffic lights. I was the poster. I was like, oh, is this a sign or something? Am I supposed to go? I was like, fuck it. So I went, like, didn't really know much about it. And yeah, I made some great friends there, great coach. I say Chris Rice, great fighter. Mm-hmm. And obviously I had Braulio there as yeah, well. yeah. It was great, and then you had a good gym upstairs, so do all your cardio and stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah I think I stayed there probably for about maybe two, three years. And what year was this? What year did you start? <sighs> what was it? Uh, I started in, I think it was either 2020 or 2021. Yeah, it's not too long ago then. No, it's not, no, no, not 2020, so 20, 2010. 2010. 20, 2011, sorry, yeah, yeah. So I was 21. Yeah, got you, right. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, when you said that, I swear you've been training longer than that. No, no, that's probably, yeah, 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 I've been training longer than that. <laughs> and the fact that it was called like Sprawl and Brawl, I was like, that's not what you'd call an no, MMA. No, that's a fucking days. great name. That's, 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 a, that's the name of a cage fighting gym, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a yeah. fucking great name. Yeah. And did you watch like UFC or anything at this point? Yeah, I had like, um, I watched uh, Chilladel Tito Ortiz. Nice. Burn number one. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I want to be like him. Yeah, okay. They even had a little mohawk and everything. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and then I, I got into that and then I went to HMV and then I bought this series of the uh, the Ultimate Fighters yeah, and I sat class. in there, put them on my DVD player and, you know, did some push-ups. And, yeah, it was good, man. Really yeah, good. that's wicked. <laughs> so, so it sounds like you potentially walked into that gym with the intention of wanting to be a fighter. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I had a very different journey into actually competing in MMA. I never really wanted to be a fighter, yeah. still don't, but um, it sometimes ends up that way. Yeah. So walking in then, so I know, I, I know depending on the gym that you walk in at, and you walk in and say, I want to be a fighter, you yeah. sometimes get like one or two reactions, I find. You either get really good coaches that go, awesome, yeah. sounds great, these are the steps that you need to take, yeah. or someone's like, yeah, all right, mate, or whatever, like get training and then we'll think about it. What sort of reaction did you get when you first walked in there? Um... 
Probably the second one, like, yeah, whatever, mate. Yeah, okay. There's this fat idiot going in there. <laughs> but no, it's um, it's an old old school gym. Yeah. You know, old school equipment. Yeah. Big iron bars everywhere, and yeah. You no, know, we call it a smelly gym. Yeah, no, nice. smelly, but that's what we call a smelly gym. So then, yeah, so you walked in. That so downstairs is an old um, industrial unit. We walked downstairs, big matted area. That was Browley's place. Got upstairs, and you walk around the gym, and then that's all the gym, cardiovascular and, and whatever. Um, and then you go down like a little set of iron stairs again into like another. Grounded was it? It was like a another large unit, and that was all matted. Had a little cage in there. I looked at it and I thought, oh, "This is cool. Like, I want to do this." And yeah, so um, yeah, I just I, I didn't even have my coach's approval to fight. I just wanted to fight because I felt I don't know maybe growing up I had to prove myself mm-hmm. in some sort of way. So I just to take fights and like probably shouldn't have. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you were just jumping in. I just jumping in, mate. Like, I had no fear at that point. Yeah, and how did your like coach feel about that? Because I've going back in the day you know sort of you know we had we had a couple of lads like that so back when I was training with Kenny in the early days and we had an, an MMA team you know if, if lads come in and, and kind of did that so fights had to be arranged through yeah. you know Kenny and the coaching staff mm. if if lads went off and just went and approached like a promotion directly yeah, it was very much a case of like you know we didn't agree to this you know we don't necessarily feel you're ready do what you want, but we're not representing you. Yeah, yeah. And and there were occasions where that happened, and, and some of the lads would then go and corner them and stuff. Like, were your were, were the coaches at the club like, oh fuck it, let's just go and help him out? Or no, nah, there was okay. exactly the same thing. Like, oh, we're not we're not representing you. Like, we don't feel you're ready. But I just I wanted to go and just see what it was all about okay. and just feel it. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, I definitely wasn't ready. I definitely wasn't ready. Yeah. So so I I probably started MMA training probably around 2007, 2008. Mm-hmm. So similar sort of time. Mm-hmm. And I remember the sparring back then was rough as fuck. Yeah. Like really rough. Yeah. It sounds like it was the same for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. definitely made the- yeah. The, the club when I joined, it was full of like big roided up doormen. Yeah. Just local hard men. And it was horrible as a, as a youngster going into yeah. that. Yeah. It's like, it was the hardest competition, isn't it really? Isn't yeah. It? Like controlled sparring or trying to learn technique or help each other learn. It's like, you're getting chinned. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it used to happen a lot, and it wasn't always like the most productive way of learning, should we say? But you know, it served the purpose maybe for the time. Yeah. But going from like that level of sparring even into fighting, like there's still a difference, right? And it's mainly because of the you know the spectator element, because of the stakes involved with actually it being a record and that type of thing. How did you find that? You know, that kind of sparring and then going into that first fight. Where were the emotions? Um, I'm 100 percent honest. I shit myself. I still do every single time. Like the worst part is for me, like obviously you know you get your line up and you get the order that you come out. Mm-hmm. The worst thing is like hearing that knock at the door when you're warming up, like your name, like, oh, fuck, 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 fuck. And then your hands are wrapped, you get your gloves on, and then you're walking out, you know, you won't be on the curtain or the door or whatever to go out. And it's just like, it's a bit, so you're walking up with your music and wave everyone and, and then they close it. As soon as, as soon as your opponent's in and I hear that click, it just, I don't hear anything, it's mm-hmm. kind of weird. Know what I mean? Yeah, I had a very similar experience. I used to, I used to nap before my fights. Oh, did you? Nice. Yeah. Nice. And it was, likewise, I, I wasn't, I don't know if I was scared necessarily, but I found it so fucking stressful. Yeah. I wasn't necessarily scared of like getting hurt or, or the actual like, the opponent necessarily, mm. but yeah, just making a fool of myself, letting people down. It yeah. was all that sort of stuff. And I found that like massively stressful and just in an attempt to suppress that anxiety, yeah. I used to find it exhausting, mate. Yeah. And, my nutrition probably wasn't great back then either, which didn't help. And I, yeah, I always napped, mate. I always like napped beforehand. So that was how I handled it. But I agree that when I got in there, mm. you kind of just, you kind of zone in and just kind of went a little bit into autopilot. Yeah, you, you, well, you got no choice, have you? No. So, That's yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. It's just like, it was like the fear of the unknown. Oh, I'm going to get knocked out. Is it going to mm. be 10 seconds? Is it going to be, you know, is it going to be go the full distance? But it's like, oh, I'm getting knocked out and everyone's going to, oh, you know, Dave and or nowadays it can be, you know, on a reel on YouTube. Yeah. Or, you know, there's a lot of things going through, but I found as soon as I'd done that, I thought, I could do that again. Yeah, but I was lucky that my first opponent wasn't very good. So I, I got the win yeah. relatively comfortably. Um, obviously for you, it went a bit sideways. Mm. Obviously quite a serious injury. Yeah, yeah. KO. Yeah, yeah double whammy. Yeah. <laughs> what, so you dislocated your shoulder and got knocked out? Yeah. Yeah, so that you said that it was in the fight, right? And then the guy basically saw that he couldn't get his hand off, so just yeah, yeah. give him a head kick for, yeah. for good <laughs> luck. Yeah, so I was, I was doing him the first, like, if, uh, I, just, I just boxed, really, do you know what I mean? A little bit of jiu-jitsu. There was just very basic arm bar, you know, a bit of a guillotine of maybe just reverse someone's position. But, yeah, so it was me uh, just, just boxing him, and then what it was, I don't think I warmed up correctly, so I 
I'd stretched for the jab and my shoulder overstretched and then it fell out. So, yeah, I carried on and then my uncle's coming banging it back into place. And he's like, let's go back out there. And I was like, okay, he's kicking, he's kicking. So like, I've tried to do that and it's like, it wouldn't come up. And I think he noticed and I was trying to, you know, circle out or take his space away from him. But that just didn't work. Mm-hmm. Obviously, hence the knockout. Yeah. It was a good kick, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. But like for me, like, because I got the win, I was like, okay, I'll give that another go. Yeah. But I think if I'd taken that sort of loss, I don't know if I would have felt the same way. Yeah. Like, how did you pick yourself up after that sort of loss to, to, to still think I, I could do that again? Um, I went back. And I kind of learned, do you know what I mean? I, I was glad, glad I experienced it, but I learned from what everyone was saying was correct, not that oh, I'm unstoppable, because I mean, obviously you're not. So I went back to the drawing board and I trained and you know, I bought a gi, trained more jiu-jitsu, took it a bit more seriously, um, it's a bit better, you know? And uh, yeah, just... Jiu-jitsu is massive, isn't it? For, for that, you yeah, know what I mean? It's massive, just, yeah. it's, if, someone's good at, if someone's better at you than jiu-jitsu, you're fucked, well, yeah. Yeah. Oh, especially back then, eh? like fighting yeah, at sort fucking, of a, yeah. an amateur level. If you even had like... Two like strike white belt. belt. Yeah. Two, oh, two, 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 two strike white belt, mate. You <laughs> really? fucking yeah. people up. People knew nothing back then, mate. Uh, crazy. Yeah, Gordon Ryan that. back then, weren't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you were, mate. But yeah, it's actually a blue belt, mate. You're like, fuck. Yeah, if you're fighting a blue belt. If you're having food a purple belt, you'd yeah. like, be you're terrified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah, yeah. imagine. I can imagine because how powerful it is, isn't it? Yeah, like, definitely. They get their fucking hands on you, they get one takedown, and you're fucked. Yeah, especially like if you didn't know anything. I think some of the young lads are in the gym at the moment. And they're striking all the time. I'm like, boys, you need to do more jets. Yeah. yeah. It's fine, you can hit or whatever. But if you get someone like even me, who's just just be able to keep you down and beat the shit out of you. <laughs> you know, you've got to be able to get out, boys, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I do agree with that. Yeah, and of course you had that amazing resource in, in Brad or Steamer as well, that right, your doorstep. Yeah, definitely, mate. He's um I say he's one of the best in the world, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Well certainly back then I think he was probably the current world champion at that yes, point. Yes, I think yeah, I think ADCC was yeah. here. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's yeah. fucking sick, isn't it? But yeah, back then it must have been like, yeah, like secret sauce, isn't it? But, <laughs> like but, what he was showing you. Like, but back then you, you didn't even you didn't even realise like how good he is, no. do you know what I mean? Because yeah. he wasn't such a big thing. Like, no. like now if you go into the gym, everyone, like, oh my god, it's Brawler, but back then it's oh you're right, Brawler. It's like It wasn't it wasn't it wasn't massive back then. Mate, in fairness, you say that, back then I didn't even really know what jiu-jitsu was. No, it was very much a he dark said heart, to me, I think. Yeah, he yeah. said to me in 2010 when I was playing football, like, what's jiu-jitsu? I just like, grey. Mm. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? I'd be like, yeah. I ain't got a fucking clue, really, mate. Was it it's similar to Aikido? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't even know what Aikido is. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, mate, so true. And then what was your second fight? My second fight was against someone actually very, very good. Okay. So again, I took my own fight because I thought I was, you know, <laughs> I thought I was, yeah, I trained for a bit and I thought it was good. And then, yeah, I thought, um, what's his name? His name's Dean Martin. And he was, um, I think he won like a tournament last time. So he did like a six month tournament. I think he won it and he won it again. Um, yeah, it didn't last very long. Again, I made a bit of an idiot out of myself. It wasn't. Didn't get knocked out though? No, didn't get knocked out. No, just beat up, just beat up basically, yeah. So it wasn't until after that fight, like I thought, oh, do you know what? I'm not doing that again. No, I'm not gonna, you know, get my own fights. I'm just gonna, you know, train, enjoy it, not put pressure on myself. And yeah, I did, and it was a, uh, it was, it was good. I think as like a, a sort of young lad, certainly back then, like getting into sort of MMA and, and cage fighting stuff, there, there's strangely, I think, a bit of admiration in surviving the fight. Yeah, yeah, so definitely. even just even if you don't get the win. Like you took your licks, you got out of there. Yeah. You didn't really beat me; it was just a decision. Yeah, you know, I can imagine that probably made you feel a little bit better, and maybe some way ticking a box. Yeah, definitely. It is. I mean, it's. Um, I did. I did get a good hiding, to be fair, but it was very, very good at the time. Yeah. Like now I, I smash him. Uh-huh. Like, I don't think. I don't think he trains anymore. Um, but like, so if I went in as I was now, like, and I trained, and, and I'd, I'd, I'd walk the floor with everyone. I thought mm. I really would which is a shame because, you know, it reflects on your record and stuff like that. So it's, um, yeah, it's a bit, a bit of a, it's a bit of a learning curve, I'd say. Mm-hmm. But yeah, after that, that's when it was proper, proper serious. So tell us about like uh, the next couple of fights that you had sort of training and being supported, correct? Yeah, so it's a different world, mate. It's, it's really, really, um, it doesn't make all the difference. You know, you've got people who know what you're saying in your corner, like I said, you're shouting, punch, punch, like, <laughs> You know, it's um, and then they're giving you confidence for your warm up, wrapping your hands correctly, you know, giving you correct advice like, oh, we've watched him fight, we think he's going to do this, watch out for this, because I think he's going to do that first. And, um, like, yeah, generally, like, what they say generally happens. So, you know, you've got a game plan. Um, and, uh, and, and, yeah, and then I'd went out and I'd fought for Sprawl and Brawl. 
and um, I thought a jiu-jitsu guy, and I gave it to him. Nice. One minute and ten seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and how'd that make you feel, mate? Yeah, wicked, mate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. if I'm listening to you guys again. <laughs> yeah. And was it like, for you at that point, was there any kind of like, I don't know, like emotions from like your upbringing and stuff that kind of came out in that moment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I was very, very proud of myself, and I thought, did you know, I like it. It wasn't like feeling like a like a man, but if I like you know, I'd actually accomplish something with my life. Mm. I mean, it's only a small fight. There's probably about like hundred people there. It's not, and it was um, yeah, it was a big moment in my life, and I was, I was very pro very proud of that. Mm. Especially if I had a jiu-jitsu guy and guillotine him, I was like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, yeah, nice, mate. That's cool. Yeah, he, yeah, threw his gum shield out and kicked it. He was annoyed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> And was there an element like I guess like growing up in the in the kind of way that you did? Um, you know, in sort of in a rough area and then probably getting filled in a lot in training, losing two fights. Yeah. Was there like an element of you kind of having doubts about your ability to kind of defend yourself? And then in that situation, you were like, yeah, I'm sorted. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Gave me, yeah, a lot of confidence. Um, I didn't question myself so much anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot, a lot of men, well, probably everybody questioned their ability and oh, what would I do in this situation? Could I handle that? And that was for me, that set it in stone that I could. Mm. And then what happened from there moving forward? Um, so you were what age at this point, roughly? Um, still quite young, lad? Yeah, still quite young. I, c I couldn't tell you the exact age, probably maybe 23, 24, Yeah, okay. Like. Yeah. And then sort of like moving on from there, like what did like sort of training, competing, sort of personal life and everything look like for you, like for you over the next um, sort of few years? So personal life, um, pretty, pretty shit to be honest. So like I'd... Um, I'd say it was drinking, drugs, smoking, you know, just out with the, with the wrong people. So not, um, not entirely living like a, an MMA athlete then? No, not at all, not at all. But like obviously uh, when you grow up, you start getting better money and stuff. Yeah. And you know, you think, oh, you, you meet certain people at work and stuff like that, you'll go for a beer after work or you go out Saturday and have some food and, you know, go to this bar or that place. And then I feel if it, I feel if it wasn't for that, I think I, like the calibre of the people that I trained with and the amount I trained, and I should be a lot further. Like, mm. like I should be like a lot, lot further than I should have. But all that got in the way, which is I regret. I do really regret like you no know, drinking and you know drugs and just chasing, just being a young lad. Mm. But like, yeah, it's um not good. No. And what sort of drugs were you taking? Uh, coke pills, cat. MDMA, weed, mm. all of it. Basically, yeah. <laughs> basically, yeah. So, yeah. Obviously, it's um, it's, uh, it's kind of that culture back then. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's so much now because you got so much, you got so much gym and fitness and health, mm. like in your way. But back then, it was like, oh, let's go out and get steamy and um, yeah, yeah that's sound. And you just you follow suit, don't you? Because then, uh, being a young single lad, you're trying to find a girlfriend or you know just fit in with places really. Mm. And then all that badness comes along with it. And then before you know it, you're like four or five years down the road, you're like, oh, fuck, what have I done with my life? Mm. I put it up my nose, I smoked it and I drank it and I pissed it at the wall. What for? Yeah. All I got was a sore head from it. And like, you know. <laughs> yeah, but man, I, uh, I won't beat yourself up too much. Fuck, you know, it's like no. pretty much everyone. <laughs> yeah. I fucking know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you know I, mean? yeah I, I agree. I think a lot of people kind of experience that sort of lifestyle when they grew up. What was your... Um, I think, yeah, I think growing up in a, in the sort of rougher areas and low deprived areas, I think you typically dabble a bit of weed, yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, what was your first experience with Class A, like, do you remember? Yeah, it was, um, I, uh, it was on the way to, uh, I think it was an away football game. Like, I'm not really a big football fan, but like, tried to fit in and, and gone, and it was on the, fucking having a line on the back of a coach, and I was like, oh, this is great. Uh, it's cool, everyone was doing it, you thought, oh, yeah, it's one of the lads, you've got your Stone Island coat on, and you got your burger and your beer, and it's like, Again, it's just trying to fit in, I think. Mm. Um, but yeah, and it kind of went down a little bit from there. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, it's um, not good. Tell us about that. Yeah, it just became more and more of a habit. Um, yeah, just spending ridiculous amounts of money on it and, you know, not sleeping and, you know, trying to function on it and, you know, potentially impacting your job, your relationship with, uh, I don't know, partners or family at the time. And yeah, it's just, it just becomes a bad, bad habit, and it's like you don't know that you've lost control over it. Like you could, you know, as soon as I remember, like going to the pub, you're like having a pint, and literally without like, his first sip, you're like, oh, you get one of them. So, yeah, so 
you don't even know that you know it's um that it's a problem at all. And as well, it's hard to see that there's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Well, I've spoke to my mates before about it when they've that when I can see them getting a bit fucking. You speak to them about nah, it's nothing wrong. Yeah. It's not not a problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then yeah, you mate, you're doing that work. <laughs> it's oh, a fucking yeah. problem. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. No, but yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, of, yeah of course, like, yeah, of course. You know. So what so when was the first was there was there an incident or like you know anything that happened that you may that maybe made you think that actually I do have a bit of an issue here? Yeah, I realised it myself. It was it was like, I think it was I don't know what year it was, I don't know how old I was, but it was like to a point where like I think I think I've checked my bank and like I'd recently been paid and I was like, Where the fuck's all that gone? And then you felt shit and then you're eating shit and then you just continually feeling shit and you're just in bed all the time and I so I can't do this anymore. Can't do this anymore. So you know, you try and you try and then you always got those that's why, I, that's why I changed jobs and I changed like circle of friends because it was just like completely around you all the time, like oh so should we go out, should we have a beer? I'm like, yeah, but it won't be a beer. We're like, oh, yeah, well, we'll be fine, we'll be fine. And I was like, oh, we've got work tomorrow. They're like, oh, yeah, come on, stop being a fan of him. Like, it's, again, it's like trying to, you know, people please and fit in and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, it just never ended up a beer, did it? <laughs> <laughs> so there was nothing, um, nothing sort of bad that happened that made you change? It was more just a sort no, of realisation? I mean, not, not until later in life. I mean, like a few, a few years ago, I've lost a couple of friends. Mm. Like, um, like being out at a, at a club or whatever and, and they've back at home they can't get to sleep so it's like sleeping tablets mm -hmm. so obviously your heart different stops and the heart stopped in their sleep so I know two people that happened to yeah. Um, yeah it's just a shame and then a couple of people who have had like not ODs but you know like being violently sick in their sleep and choked and stuff mm -hmm. and suffocating themselves and it's like I mean don't get me wrong I've, I've taken a sleeper after trying to get to sleep and stuff like that so thank god it hasn't happened to me um, but so many people do that as well, and it fucking yeah, but you, so many. But unless you know, you don't know. You think oh, I was just a sleeper. But, but people, people, I think it's. I don't know if it's more recently, but I know I know a few people as well who've, who've, who've fucking died because of that. Yeah. But I never really heard of it before. But I, I don't know if it's because people are using like dies pans and more shit like that, like like the more readily readily available, or people are just getting hooked on them a bit more. Maybe I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it seemed like loads of people in the last maybe four or five years. Yeah. I just fucking just died like that. Yeah, I think obviously I think it's a bit easier to get those sort of things from the doctors now. Obviously, people are having more mental health issues and stuff like that. You know, I think it's more easily accessible from you know to get diet pounds or sleepers and stuff like that. Mm. So, obviously, I think it's probably that effect that it's more available. Yeah. I think personally. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> so we've got through childhood, yeah. early days of MMA. Yeah. Obviously, you're partying and and kind of uh, <laughs> binging point of your life and then you kind of move away from that circle you change jobs and then kind of where did your life take you next yeah so my wife uh, so my wife my life took me to my wife um, I've known her uh, since uh, school and then I reconnected with her and then um, I'd gone through a bad relationship at that time and so she so we were both single at the time and we just went from there really I've known her since I was 15 still good friends now um, obviously I go into it a bit later, but I lost my wife at one point, you know. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I was grateful to find her. Really, she's uh, had a really, really positive impact in my life, mm -hmm. and yeah, she's a, she's a wonderful person. So, when you say that it kind of led you to your wife, so you reconnected with yeah. this person, um, and then you got married, or yeah. So um, it's quite a funny one actually. So. Um, we got married after about being a month together. Okay. We just fucked off to Vegas and got married. <laughs> after a month? Yeah, but I've known her all my life. Yeah, I mean? no, I get it. Well, yeah. that's still fucking balls you, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know what until you live with them, mate. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that now. <laughs> no, yeah, so, uh, yeah, we, I was with her at school. Yeah. And um, I'd always, I'd always have a soft spot for her. Mm. So, I mean, I think we always did, you know, hold a candle for each other. Mm. And I was like, I said, oh, so fuck it, should we get married as a joke? She's like, yeah. I was like, really? So like, yeah, so booked a flight to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, stayed in the Bellagio. <laughs> and so then, yeah, fucked up and got married. Got a helicopter over Vegas after. She was in a wedding dress and I was in my tux. Nice. Walked the streets of Vegas. Everyone, you know, congratulating us, buying us drinks. Had a big fat pizza. I mean, the pizza was like the size of my arm, like the one slice. <laughs> so I was getting that all over her wedding dress. And then, yeah, we went to um, Lake Tahoe for a honeymoon and um, went to um, Muscle Beach. Mm -hmm. in, um, so, yes, we got a plane over to, um, from Nevada to Lake Tahoe, then Lake Tahoe to, uh, not, is it not California, California, where is Muscle Beach? 
yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. LA, so LA, so yeah. went to LA. That was that was pretty cool, mate. Mm. That was really cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mate, that sounds fucking mental. Mate, it How was. the fuck do you afford that, mate? Just fucking on a whim. No, I, I, I worked at Land Rover, so um, that's the sense why I changed. So I changed jobs. I worked at Land Rover, so my Land Rover paid a fortune. It was great, and then you get all the overtime you can physically get. So I was earning like a second hand, like six, seven hundred quid, well, six, seven hundred quid a week, and that was what. 10, 12 years ago? No, yeah, back, it's yeah, big money, isn't it? back Exactly, back yeah, then. Yeah, back then. Literally yeah. just to like, obviously it was hard work and it was factory environment, it's very regimented and stuff like that. I ended up working there for about, yeah, oh, when did I start there? 2014, 15, something like mm. that, maybe? And then by the time I met Abby, we'll back up with Abby, probably, I think it was 20... Oh, anyway, so yeah, about six, seven years ago, I think it was. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and then, um, and then what was married life like? Wonderful. No, honestly, wonderful. I love it to bits. Yeah. It was great. And then, yeah, we found out um, obviously she was pregnant. And then we had our baby Roman. And then, um, yeah, the um, first day of the pandemic, he um, passed away. Mm, sort of all right. What happened? Um, he had, um, it was something they, they used to call cot death. Okay. So basically it's hard to stop in his sleep. Right. So obviously, you know, I remember remember the night vividly, like, that kid, he's, it was just, I don't know, like, I, I believe he was there, you know, to, he, was, he was an angel. He's happy, smiley, bubbly, very advanced for his age. Like, How old was he? Seven months or two days. He was 214 days old. Um, yeah, so I had a lovely day with him, and then give him a nice bath, and I cuddled before bed, and his milk and stuff. Give him a kiss on him, I loved him. Put him in his cot because I made him his own room. Like, my always nice little wallpaper and built his cot and you know, I made it really, really nice. And I put him to bed and I just woke up to screaming. Yeah, it's, um, so it's about one o'clock in the morning. My, my wife was just screaming. I said, what's, what's the matter? And um, she came and he's not breathing. I said, what do you mean he's not breathing? So I pushed right away and I've gone. He was, um, he was lifeless in my arms. And um, I was on the phone to 999, it's like, my son's not breathing. So she taught me, um, taught me through, you know, how to do CPR. So I was doing CPR. And then I, um, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know if it was me imagining things, but I felt I got him back. But I don't know, like, I know it makes sense silly to some people, but I feel it was his soul leaving his body. Because I felt this kind of cold air and I heard his, like, a kind of a breath can pass me and pass through my body. And then, uh, um, yeah, I feel it was his soul leaving his body. Um, yeah, so I did the chest compressions and mouth to mouth probably for about 15 minutes. And then the ambulance came and, and took him. And my wife went in the ambulance. And then I literally, I just got in the car and drove, drove, drove to the hospital. And um, I was literally overtaking buses, just driving stupidly. I didn't, I didn't care. I just wanted to get there. I didn't want to miss anything, I, you know. Um, yeah, so um, I actually beat the ambulance there and I was literally opening the doors for them to push him in. And then they took him into, um, I don't know what you'd call it, like the kind of the ICU thing. And uh, yeah, I remember him pushing him into the doors. I said, oh, you can't go in. Uh, yeah, so um, I remember I just, I couldn't leave my son. So I pushed through and I just I remember seeing them trying to shock his little chest to bring him back and pumping the oxygen and they just, yeah, it's nothing, nothing, uh, couldn't get him back. And I just remember just screaming. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I can remember. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty scarring to see. Yeah, it must change you massively. It just yeah, massively, everything. yeah, massively. Couldn't even imagine it. Couldn't yeah. even imagine it. I think it's always, uh, as a parent, your biggest fear, especially with a baby, isn't it? That that feeling, the amount of times when my boy was young and I'd go in and, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and kind of by the nose. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah, and you just, yeah, I couldn't. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it was a fucking horrendous day. Mm. And it was, um, it was first, it was first that lockdown as well. Yeah. So I couldn't even escape my house. That's what I was about to say. So, yeah, I mean, um, luckily we were, we were still very strong together after. Mm. Um, but yeah, I remember they said, do you want to come and see him? And I was uh, kind of hoping to him that I should, you know, be there. 
So I held his little hand and gave him a little cross, which I've still got. Yeah, it's just, oh, it's heartbreaking. Heart's yeah, not broken, sure. mate. Yeah, I can't imagine, mate. You know, like, <clears throat> being, I wouldn't say like an alpha male, but like, as a parent, your, your main your main goal is to make sure you, you know, your kids are protected and your kids are happy and, you know, safe and provided for. And like, it just, every day it breaks my heart. Like, I just feel guilty because I couldn't do that for him. Yeah, but that that sort of stuff like when when all that happens and you couldn't leave your house and all that sort of stuff was there like again this is like what were the police like yeah because again it's like they always seem to like well, yeah. investigate it and do all that sort of stuff and what was all that like well they're they're in they're in my house um while all of this is going on and like they, they were they were pretty you know um they tread very carefully do you know what i mean obviously we've yeah, been through but obviously they they had to, you know, do their inquiries and whatever. Um, but it's like they took his, some of his things and stuff, which I did not like whatsoever. Like, but they said they had to. So obviously they did return them as soon as they could. But like, uh, um, yeah. So they did an investigation on it and stuff. Like, obviously found. Yeah. Obviously found. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, they were they were very sympathetic. They were very kind, which is a rare experience. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, um, they're pretty good. Yeah, I'm just saying, it must be such a crazy, weird, delicate situation, that sort of whole process, especially as, especially with COVID happening, you can't leave your house, you can't do anything. You must have just felt so trapped. And so yeah, it's, yeah, it's trapped is a, a very good word. Like, you couldn't even, um, you couldn't even escape to the pub to go and have a drink, you know, just for a bit yeah. of peace in, in, in the corner just to get... We couldn't even, you know, go and hug your mum and dad. Go for a walk, you know what I mean? You couldn't even go for a walk at one yeah. point, could you? No. Well, you could for once a day for 20 minutes, was it? <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, my walk at that point was to the shop to get a bottle, a bottle of vodka. That was it. I drank so much in COVID, it was unreal. Did you? Yeah, massively. And that was me trying to forget. But you didn't have any other children at that point, did you? No. It was just that was your first. Yeah. I have stepchildren from uh, my wife's previous relationship. Oh, okay. So obviously it had a massive impact on them as well. Mm. What as well as my wife. Uh, they are so I don't know how old they were, how old they were at the time, but one's twelve and one's nearly eight. Mm. So yes, yeah, so they're pretty young. They're very young. Yeah, yeah. 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 And obviously having a new baby in the house, they were centre of the attention, and they'd, they'd always play with them and stuff like that. And then it's just all of a sudden gone. Like your stepdad and your mom. Uh, constantly you know, but depressed yeah that's depressed sad they were sad as well you couldn't leave your house they couldn't go see their dad or their family it's like we were trapped in this house together mm. full of sadness and drama it's so it's horrific mate genuinely yeah. does sound like a horror story it's a nightmare, nightmare yeah, yeah. A nightmare, it? it's like yeah. the worst situation yeah I imagine you must have woke up most days like after that just almost thinking it was exactly that right Mate, so, um, yeah, so I woke up and literally I'd have like probably a three second period a day until I, you know, gained and then I remembered. And I said, oh, fuck. Uh, is, is it a dream? Is it not? And, and that sounds really cliche, but you like, give yourself a pen and see it's not a dream and it just, just a nightmare that's never ended. Do you know what I mean? And, and with cot death, you said it was about obviously the heart related. Yes. I mean, is there any more information on what caused it than that? No, there's not. Um, like there's studies and stuff like that but they they can't work it out yeah so there were no like symptoms in the run up to, to that happening I think that's, anything. that's the problem isn't it with cock death like there's, there's barely anything there's... barely anything I mean I've, I've I've read contradicting things so like I don't know where to place my trust in these yeah. these um, what would you call them reports so I don't know what to believe so there, there's a bit out there now but it's like one says one one says the other like who do you believe or what this is but I know there's one which is like a, a, a cold for a while and they have like a, a runny nose and stuff like that. And But I don't see how that affects the heart. I was about to say that as well, how many fucking babies have colds, coughs, exactly. you so know what I mean? Like how would you have yeah, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? Like Yeah, you've got no immune system. Yeah, so, exactly. so you're constantly getting something. So it's, it's, like, not an in, it's not an indicator, is it? No, you know what I mean? no, definitely not. And how did you, um, I don't know if it was you or your other half at the time or both of you, but how did you kind of communicate that to the other kids? Um... They um, they were they were there in the house, right. so obviously it was, so they knew, um, yeah. So they knew obviously, but obviously we had to. They didn't know what days in the house had already passed, 
but um, yeah, but they took it really hard as well. Mm. Yeah. And then with like the funeral and and the service, was there an option to do that given the circumstances? Yeah, it was. Um, I mean, he was in a in a chapel arrest um, while they they did their examination on him. Um, I got to see him then. It's um, it's another mad mad situation to be in. But in anxiety leading up to that, as I said, like I owed it to him to go be there with him. Um, <clears throat> sorry, but yeah, it's um, it's it's mad to see what once was to what now is. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't stay in there for a long period of time, even though I wanted to. Mm. Um, but yeah, so then it was um. It was obviously there was a lot of deaths during that time anyway, so I had a backlog for funerals and whatever, and you can only have so many people. That's what I say that, yeah. How how many people were allowed to? So I think it was twenty. I think it was the week that they upped the allowance. I think it was like ten before, then they doubled it. But like a whole road when the when the it's my from one of my friends. He's got a big top car dealership, so I couldn't get I couldn't get a hearse because his coffin was only that, that big. A little blue coffin. Um, so my friend got me over um, the big Rolls Royce 4x4, which I sat in my head up my lap because I couldn't get a hearse and I didn't want to just have any car for him, do you know what I mean? So I wanted to you know, give, him a, I'd give him a ride and something nice and the whole road like, for about a mile just full of people. And uh, yeah, it was, um, it was a sad day, but it was nice to see that, you know, so loved. Mm. Um, people, a lot of people were there for us as well. Um, yeah, and then it was, um, yeah, I, I carried his coffin. I did a little speech. And I just remember those, uh, the curtains closing, and it was just like that, that's it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry, mate. It's, it, I can't even imagine, mate. We've <laughs> obviously both, both got sons, and... Yeah. Yeah, it's fucking anybody's worst nightmare, Son of mine. Yeah. And then obviously your fucking head, mate, must have been absolutely shot, of course. Um, and you said that you actually started drinking quite heavily as well. I mean, did the NHS provide any sort of emotional well-being support for you and the family at all? Yeah, I mean, they wanted to, um, but it was like all phone consultation or Zoom. And right. I just, I wasn't ready for, t- to talk about it. It took me a long time to, um, you know, be open it's still about really it. still really raw, isn't it, at that point? <laughs> You know what I mean? It's still really raw. It was, it was weeks, mate. It was, it was weeks. I didn't even process it myself, let alone talking about it to a stranger. Mm-hmm. And yeah, do you know, it's that they offered the help and that, or oh, we're here for this concert, here's the number, we can visit this place and that place. And uh, I didn't really want to. I didn't really want to talk about it. I wanted to you know, try and deal with it in my own way, which probably in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, dealing with myself is better than speaking to other people about it. Mm-hmm. But obviously, that's why I'm so open. Yeah. Uh, I learned to be, you know, it's not a thing like, like a lot of people like shy around the death subject, but I tend not to now because you know like, it's not the first thing I tell people. Um, but yeah, I'll uh, I'll always be open and honest because it's part of my story. And uh, as I say, not moving on, but to grow in life, you have to you know accept your past and yeah, yeah and grow as a person, not forgetting them obviously. Um, but yeah, life goes on and it does. And he want the best for me, and I want the best for my family. And yeah, it's fair to in order to grow us, being open, and that's what I did. Yeah, well done, mate. And then, Thank how you. did your um, how did your wife kind of manage her emotions around it? Um, I think she was better than me, just because she wanted to be strong for me. But at the same time, I wanted to be strong for her. Um, but yeah, I mean, we weren't around each other twenty four seven. Obviously, we were at the beginning, but then obviously you could. We had our own time, you know, go for walks and stuff. We did a lot together. Like, we did a lot of walking, a lot of exercise and stuff, which is on the road back to, you know, there's not drink. Well, it was more me drinking and stuff. Obviously, she had her own drink, but I, yeah, I absolutely can drinking. Like, I could probably do one a day, like a litre a day. With vodka? Mm. Fucking hell. Yeah. That must have been so bad on your mental state, mate. Yeah. Just yeah. feeling that hungover, shitty-ass feeling every day, man. Yeah, but it's like, it, I did it to kind of forget, but it, yeah. without, you know, subconsciously, I, it was making me worse, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It makes, it, it blacks you out that day, and you wake up the next day, you feel horrendous, you do yeah. it again. It's that vicious cycle, isn't it? Exactly, just... exactly, mate. But that's all I did to try and escape it, and then it's like one day, like, 
Like, I think I probably did it constantly, you know. I, I don't get me wrong, I, I, I did drink, but when I, I didn't realise I had to, you know, properly slow down. And that was probably about a month of just constantly doing that. Mm. No days off. Yeah, it was pretty much a fucking mess. Yeah, fucking hell. Yeah. Didn't look the healthiest. Had, like, mm. a tingy uh, green skin tone and stuff oh, like that. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's always a good luck, that, yeah. mate. Yeah, yellowy green, like, you know, like a bruise when it goes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, bit, bit of jaundice, mate, lovely. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Get rid of the light. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, then we, um, we decided to go on a little fitness crusade which a lot of people did and, you know, build their own little home gyms and stuff, which we did had a, like a nice big out, out building in the garden, um, turned into a little gym, little boxing bag, wife bought a Pilates machine, I bought some dumbbells, even though they're a fucking fortune. Oh, mate, it's fucking mental how much dumbbells cost in lockdown, wasn't it? Mate, someone I know made like enough money to buy an Audi R8 off making the concrete ones and putting a bar in between them. Mate, I, I, bought, um, I bought some from Birmingham actually the, the steel plate ones yeah, like yeah. where you could put the, the plates yeah, on yeah, yeah. And he, they fucking he, mate, he hand like he drove them down and was delivering them around the southwest yeah. and he'd like out on a certain date Fair he play. was fucking making loads yeah. mate from it it's like a fabricator or something he was and he just fucking was making them yeah a couple of lads I know managed to find like um, some wholesale stuff and got it imported and then yeah. resold it and made an absolute killing mate fucking crazy well, some positives come out gotta come out of that hasn't it so <laughs> yeah so yeah, so you went on your fitness crusade. Yeah, did a bit of keto, which was pretty good. So I found that pretty good because then I knew I couldn't have a drink because yeah, it just definitely completely took me out. It's weird, isn't it? Because I don't, I don't keto in lockdown as well. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Just loads of bacon yeah. and egg. It's yeah. great. But yeah, just uh, it was also me doing it. Like obviously, if I did it all week, like and I thought oh, I have a drink and just ruin it completely. So it's probably probably a good reason that I did it as well. Mm. Like behind that, but yeah, then we go for walks, go around these nice lakes that we used to go to. And think the I think it was about so there's three like lakes together and I could be like a like nature trail all around it. I think it's about three mile all together. So we we try and do that at least once a day mm-hmm. as well as having a you know bit of a workout and just just generally be more active and healthy. And when I had a, and as soon as I as soon as I saw that change, I was like, all right, okay, no more now, no more. And yeah, it stayed that way. Yeah, awesome. for a bit, for a bit, for a bit. Okay, <laughs> then what changed? Um, yeah, so. Yeah. I was like, I can't go too much into things. I've got a bit of a um, allegedly dark past with um, undesirables as they've been put. Um, I've got a couple of charges hanging over me. Um, as I say, I don't really want to delve deeply into it. Uh, ended up me being um, you know, arrested a couple of times. I had my house raided four times. Was this was this before COVID no, or after? After, after. So you went... So you, all that tragedy happened and started drinking, yeah. got yourself better, and then yeah. got yourself into some shit. Yes, basically. Yeah. So I know there's obviously components that you can't get into, and it's obviously all alleged at this point. Yes. But can you tell us, like, how you got on that path? Um, yeah, I can. It's, um, you know, like, a, you know, people, you don't really know what people get up to, you know, if you work with them or go to gym with them, like, you don't, it's not really like a, bit of a that's put it, um, it's not really something you'd, you'd advertise if you if you do certain things, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I became friends with certain people from work, from gyms and stuff like that, who were as quote undesirable, as old Bill put it, um, into, I don't, I don't know what they were into. But alleged the same same things as me, but that is um, it's not true. Right. Um, and yeah, so so things you know got out of hand, and I've been accused of you know, many different different uh, so there's many different accusations thrown my way. Um, uh, yeah, as I say, it's still hanging over my head. Um, I don't know really how to put things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is there anything that Maybe you've been accused of previously that, you know, is, is now been ruled out that you can discuss? Um, let me think, let me think, let me think. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the, the one which aren't related to these two are um, assault with a deadly weapon, which okay. I was cleared off straight away. I mean, yeah. I, I got, I got assault, um, assaulted, I got accused for assaulting somebody with a knuckle duster. Okay. Um, so, yeah, basically it was um, somebody, I don't know, They'd um, had a bad business deal with somebody, and I don't, um, yeah, they caught up with him, and 
because there was a picture flying round of him with a broken nose and on the floor covered in blood. Like it was, uh, it was assumed it was me, but obviously that proved that it wasn't because I was in a completely different building, um, the other side of the city, which CCTV proved, which was, which was nice, which was nice. <laughs> yeah, benefits of cameras, but yeah, I mean, um, and I know off air you said that, like you've been in you've been injured a bit in the last few years. Yeah, like so um, you can tell us about that. Yeah, so I was um, I've been stabbed on several different occasions. Um, several, uh, several different occasions. So um, uh, one my most most recent stabbing was six times. Um, so I'll go for the scenario. Um, I was going to my auntie's, I think it was. So I think I'd, I don't know where, but I think I'm shopping. I was going to drop something over to my auntie's house. I think she, I don't know, I grabbed her something because um, she wasn't very well. So I was going to drop it over. And my my opinion is it was a bit of road rage because on my phone, I was going down the country road. Uh, on my phone, no, I, just, I just shouldn't be. But I was really driving really slow. And then I had some kids beeping me. I was like, oh, sorry. And then so I started trying to overtake me. And I thought, like, what the fuck's this dickhead doing? So... And then so I slammed my, you know, when you, you red light them just to like get them off your ass. So I did that and I think pissed him off. They started touching my bumper. So I thought they slammed my brake on. I pulled over, what's your problem? And then like, uh, guys come up the passenger side and he's ran at me and I seen like a shiny thing in his hand and it was a knife. So I was like, what the fuck? So luckily I can fight. So I've cracked him, dropped him. I was trying to like, fill him in a bit. And then the next thing I know, someone's got out the, out the, the rear passenger door. And I'm fucking hell. Uh, cracked him as well. And like the other one's out. I was trying to, trying to eat him as well, but I didn't realise that the driver was still there. And then the next thing I know, I woke up in a pile of blood. So, obviously they've done what they've done. And I've took myself in my own car, driven 20 minutes to hospital, which was close by. Going in absolutely soaked full of blood, my head's peeling open, my sides are peeling open. Like, oh, sorry, we're not an a and &E. I was like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> <laughs> not even joking. So I had to go to another hospital. Uh, blood's all over the floor, running down my head, is my eyes I couldn't see. Did they just not know the extent of your injuries at that point? Well, no, I said, I've been stabbed, can you help me, please? Like, Surely they would just send you away. On my mum's life, they sent me away. Fucking so I had to drive another 20 minutes, which I couldn't, then I couldn't get my car started. So then I had to read my wife and tell her what happened. Bear in mind, she was, she was, no, she wasn't pregnant. My son was born probably about two weeks prior. So I chatted with my mother-in-law, my mother pit, mother in law picked me up, like, absolutely horrified. And I was like, oh, fucking hell. Um, yeah, so and then I went to the hospital and then I got patched up and came over. I was gonna say, just to be clear then, so this this was literally just, you didn't know these people? I'd never seen them in my life, no. Never seen them in my life. I'd never seen the car in my life. Okay. It was an old BMW X5. Yeah. And they, did they ever get caught? Ever, ever catch them? I think at the play, I didn't, I didn't know anything at all. I knew it was a black X5 and it was like, how many of them are in the country? Mm. Like, they weren't masked or anything. Like, I'd known if I'd seen them. Yeah. They weren't foreigners. They were just... They were only young lads. Yeah. But, like, yeah, because I obviously break-checked them. Yeah. Like, I obviously got pissed off what I was fucking doing because Birmingham's a bit... I don't know, it's like... The youth out there are absolutely fucking nuts for, like, cowboys. It's... They just don't give a shit. They don't care. They'll stab you for less. Mm. They really will. And, yeah, it's a lot of violence. So, yeah, it was, it was around the Birmingham area then that yes. this happened? Yeah. So what else then? So you got stabbed six times there? Yeah, I've been stabbed uh, previously that before. So as I say, several different occasions. I got stabbed uh, in between my leg there with, I think it was a stand knife. What's that about? That was just out the, on a night out. And that was just like, you know, it was just like a little bit of a scuffle. And that wasn't, uh, that's what I'm saying, that they'll, they'll, people will just stab you for anything. And it's uh, it was just a bit of a scuffle. And then I, thought, I, had a, I, I didn't even throw a punch. I just got him off someone he was fighting with. And then next thing I know, it's like my, my leg was all like warm. I thought, I pissed myself. I turned around and I seen like my jeans were all ripped. I was pissed off because they were like a nice Armani ones as well. And I said, they were real ripped there. And it was just like, like this dark patch. And it was inside. And then that, it was inside like a dark club mm. or a bar or whatever it was. So then I walked out and I seen it's all like dark red. And I said, fucking hell, I didn't even realise. But like it was like that far away from like a main vein mm. artery thing. Fucking hell. Yeah, so that was the other one. Okay. And then yeah, I was out of out of the city, out of Birmingham, or somewhere else. And then um, yeah, I got I got the spray of a, a, a shotgun in my stomach. So it wasn't like the full blast. It was like you know. So shooting, was someone was someone shooting someone else or shooting? I don't know. 
Well, what? Come on, right? You got, how, how the fuck do you get in those situations? <laughs> like, yeah, just, like... just, just bad, bad time, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was, in, it was in a car park, and yeah, I was uh, having a chat with someone, and the next thing you know, it was like, yeah, it just burnt. Like. So it's not often in the UK that people let off firearms. Um, yeah, I mean... I mean, maybe a little bit more in Birmingham, perhaps. Yeah. To be fair, when I worked up there years ago for a little bit, there was a shooting up there, I remember. So I think, it, obviously... It's still, it's still pretty rare. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we'll, we'll have some American, you know, sort of listeners probably watching this, and yeah. they'll be... What's the fucking big... <laughs> what's the big fucking deal? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, yeah, we do need to be very clear that in the UK, gun crime is absolutely, like, almost non-existent. Yeah, it's just it's not... Stabbing all, all the time. time yeah. but, all the time, yeah. mate. So, like, so you were in a car park... Mm-hmm. And you were, without naming names, what, with mates or...? or yeah, 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 well, acquaint- acquaintance, okay. uh, acquaintance. And were you, were you loitering in the car park or were you just like in I was, I was in the car park, we were having a chat right. um, about something, literally. I think it was, it was a warm day at the time, yeah. so everyone was in a beer garden yeah. and, and stuff like that, but I wasn't past searching in the car park. I was talking right. to the car. Next thing I know, I've had this big bang, windows gone through, next thing another bang, and then I'm like... You sat in the car? No, 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 no. Just sat inside? No, 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 not sat in the car, stood up, just talking. Just stood up? Yeah, stood up. Yeah. So where did, where did the shot come from? Like a passerby in a car, or...? No, it wasn't, it wasn't a bike, it was someone walking, but I don't know who it was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened then, then? So obviously, again, a and Oh, yeah. <laughs> The, yeah, the, the right, the right one this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I found the right one. Well, it was a different city, mate. So it was a bigger hospital. Right. Was there any like fucking major complications for that, or was it just like a greatest like shrapnel? No, no just just guess a bit of shrapnel, mate. It's just got like, like a tiny little scar there. It's probably mm. probably I don't know that, that big. Mm. It looks like you know when you it's sort of like um, what would you call it? You know, like when you at the end of a sausage, mm-hmm. like it's all starred. That was mm. it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. They yeah, just burnt. <laughs> and was anybody else more seriously hurt in that incident? Um, no. Uh, car was like pretty much destroyed all the windows yeah. gone through and yeah like I'm glad it wasn't like I don't know like a couple of foot over because yeah. I think that would have been me <laughs> yeah okay and the people you were with yes were they the sort of people that someone might want to take a shot at or was it completely random uh, potentially but I don't um, I don't really know what people get up to so um, mm. potentially yeah. <laughs> okay just going back to just a couple of bits real yeah. quick um, you mentioned obviously that the house got raided a couple of times. Yes. Um, and also, I wanted to ask as well during the the arrests, were you ever like remanded or have you ever done any jail time or anything? Yeah, I've done a little bit, just remand. Yeah. Okay. Nothing like nothing like fully sentenced, but like I've always been released because not not um, seeing sufficient evidence, so I've been released pending investigation, which I still am now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one's one's been going on a couple of years now. The first one. And the one, the other one's been more recent. Yeah. Um, that was, yeah, about a year ago. Okay. Inside the change. What before you just come, just before you come down here? The year about three months before. Yeah. Probably slightly, maybe slightly longer. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously, I'm just want to try and like just close out, I guess, the situation with your with your wife because obviously you know you've kind of patched that back up. <laughs> just at the point where she kind of walked away from you for a period. I mean, was that like to do with? You know, was the the, 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 the house raid, was she, you know, was she there, were the kids there? Yeah, kids were there, yeah. Yeah, what was that experience like? Um, I think they were pretty delicate because the kids were there. Okay. But like, um, yeah, it's not, not something that's ideal. I mean, it was it was when I was I was driving, then I, I got pulled over by armed police, about mm-hmm. like 15 of them, like for one person, and I was fucking serious. And the clothes off the road, and like parading me like I was a prize pig. I was like, what's this for? And like, they searched my car, didn't find anything. And like, searched my house, didn't find anything. And like, this is, this is when I changed myself. So this is all like prior to, you know, um, the alleged mm. um, incidents that they're on about. So this is all like, you know, so in that, what was it, backlash maybe? So from my, pre- from my previous things. Um, that they're, they're I'm being accused of. So this is um, this is after I've, I've you know I've changed to no 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 drinking, no smoking, gym, positive mind and stuff like that. So it's like oh, trying to you know be a better person. But all these things keep fucking like, cropping back up, and it's like when does it end? Mm. And then when you get remanded, um, do you go to prison or is it like that's like a holding place? Is it so okay. basically where you go to? Yeah, so. Yeah, pretty grim place. Yeah, yeah shit, isn't it? 
Ever, <laughs> ever, 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 and I know it's gone there, so it's fucking worse. Have I said you? <laughs> no, no, no. Got a few mates who've been remanded over the years, and they uh, they all say it's fucking horrendous. Yeah. yeah, shit, mate. But like, I wasn't even remanded like close. Oh, like, really? Yeah, I don't know say where I was, but they fucked me off like hundred mile away from my family. Oh, do they? Yeah, wankers. Yeah. So, what was the experience like? Did you have any kind of run-ins? Is it you? Are you with other people as well? Like, I, I get myself listen. to myself because I'm from a different city, right. and I barely spoke to anyone. Right. This was me still changing. This was me yeah, being positive. Yeah. And I thought, if I get to speak into any of you lot, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And then was it, like, at what point did did your wife, like, kick you out or kind of walk away? Um, yeah, she kind of had enough. Um, uh, she, obviously, she was there for me. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we separated, but it was, yeah, we weren't together, yeah. but we still remained friends. Yeah, okay. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was a hard one. Um, yeah, she's always been there like for the whole thing supporting me yeah. which I'm very very grateful for she yeah. sounds like a good woman mate yeah, yeah. she's a wonderful woman she's worth the weight in gold yeah, she really yeah. is bro. and it's like you know a lot of people are running, are running a million miles mm. but like she's I'm sure she's had her reservations about it but I couldn't be without her I really couldn't I love mm. the bits yeah brilliant and then you obviously had that chat on the phone you've you've moved away you've sort of obviously got yourself up on the right track now when did like what was the um I guess when you kind of like convinced to sort of come back or or whatever, what was you know what was that experience like? Ah, uh, it's, it's um yes, yeah, so obviously she's she has, she has her own house. Um, obviously I don't live there; I live down here. But I want to visit her, go and yeah. vice versa. But yeah, it just it just felt like when we first got together, that was that was you know been back in love again. It's, mm. it's, it's nice, mate. It's nice. And obviously I've seen kids seeing them, the mum and dad together and then obviously I've gotten really well with my stepkids. Yeah. I've, I've treated, never treated them differently to my own. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously their dad's still around and he's good dad getting well with him, which is nice, which is pretty rare these days as well, do you know what I mean? Um, but we do it for the kids' sake. And yeah, just, I feel like a family again because mm. we broke up for so long. And yeah, I just um, I don't think it's that of my experiences or, you know, generally bad experiences. Mm -hmm. Growing up, and yeah, it's a um, happy home. My yeah. kids are happy. My wife's happy. I'm happy. That must have been a fucking crazy couple of years, though, mate. Oh, Fuck mate, yeah. yeah. And, and did all this happen after the pandemic, after obviously yes. losing your son? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, if, if you were... Uh, sounds like it just spiraled out, spiraled massively, out of control, massive, mate. Massively, yeah. mate. Ma like yeah. Been... Massively. And, and on that, mate, how... Obviously, were you still ever training MMA at this point, or was uh, you just yeah. fucked it all off at this point? So... I'd gone back to it. So um, after after the pandemic, I'd gone to a gym, which was a little bit more local because I lived kind of um, out the way a bit. So it got a bit more local to me, which was Tech Planet Redditch, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good gym. Um, I trained there for a bit. Bit of nogi? Yeah, plenty of nogi, mate. <laughs> no, plenty of pyjama wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, plenty of nogi. I mean, I had my, um, had my fair share of, you know, good beatings in there as well so did you like every time was was mma your like retreat when you was trying to get yourself back on track you were like oh, i'm gonna get back in the fucking gym i'm gonna get trained i'm gonna sort myself out and then i imagine then you just fucking relapsed got in with the wrong crowd and it kept fucking up a little bit basically yeah, yeah. basically right. but my it's um it's a it, it's a hard world to get out of mate isn't it massive massive you know what i mean that's what that's what people don't realize they go wow well, how's it happen how's it and, that. and it's once you're in it's 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 uh you become a different person you become something you're not you lie mate that's a big thing as well i find find people that i've known they they end up lying and lying and lying you lie to yourself to, as well. to, yeah you lie to yourself you lie to the people around you you know and then then kind of people wonder why no one wants to be around you towards exactly. the end you know mate, what i mean mate, exactly I mean, and I that's lost, the fucking truth of it isn't it lost family lost friends like good friends yeah. close family um you know i lost my wife uh, I lost access to my kids because they didn't want to be around it and that's another depression again. Yeah, and so yeah, of course, yeah. But prior to this, I think um, that's more recent um, is what I'm all about there. So prior to that, yeah, I um, went back to just to Nogi. And, uh, yeah, had a, good, um, had a good fight team there. Uh, like a West Tully, I think he was ranked number two amateur in the country at the time for lightweight. So I sparred him quite a lot. Um, Quite a good friend. He's a he's a brother of one of my, one of my other friends as well. Who would, um, used to do some. He's got a big cabling company, so I did a bit of that for a while. Um, and yeah, and then 
fought at Redditch, I fought uh, on a golden ticket fight promotion, mm-hmm. which is like a charity fight for my son, you know. Um, and that was, that was a lot of pressure, you know, mm, a lot of pressure. I, like, I didn't want to let my son down, I didn't want to let myself down, and you know, I had a lot of people there, you know, and, uh, you know, the t shirt and stuff, and it was all for him. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like this, I see, like, he's like, I can't ever retreat, get back to normal life, you just yeah. know, mate? and it's like, it's discipline, it's, you know, it humbles you. Mm. You know, you go into a gym, like, yeah. people are like, looking, you know, like, there could be anything could strangle you, and there could be a black belt, you, you, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that. yeah, MMA, Jiu-Jitsu, all that sort of stuff definitely fucking humbles you, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a mental fucking journey, mate. And I mean, it sounds like, despite your upbringing, you know, throughout your sort of, I guess your 20s, yeah. you know, up until the point you met your, your wife, and obviously the tragedy happened, it doesn't sound like you really got in, in too much trouble during that period. Mm-hmm. And then obviously coming out of the pandemic and, and, and that alone without obviously losing your son was would have been tough as it was for a lot of people. Obviously yeah. with those circumstances, it's an, it, not even imaginable. Mm-hmm. I mean, coming out of that and getting involved with some of these people and some of this stuff, was there like, you know, where was your head at? Was there a bit of like a fuck it like attitude or or did you just, it was, was it just- money? So I did, I did, I did one myself anyway, because I had, I had my own business, like, I was building contractors. Yeah. So like, I, had, I had nice things, yeah. I had a nice house, nice yeah. cars, a nice van, holidays, twice a year, cleaner. Yeah. You know, everything we could have wanted. And like that all got taken off me because they believed that I was doing something that I wasn't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, hence why my wife didn't want to be part of my life anymore. Hence why, you know, like I lost some majority of access to my kids. Not, yeah. not forcibly, but, you know, like, obviously a bit living apart. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't see my kids every day because, mm-hmm. you know, it's not how it works when you split up. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, like, um, yeah, it's, it's just a vicious cycle that, you know, it has repeated itself a few times. But I know I can drag my play, myself out of the darkest places mm-hmm. known to man, and I have done several times. Yeah. But now, like, it feels different because I'm, I'm the person that I know I should be. It's, and I, like people say all the time, like, all the time it's different, but for me it is. I'm, I'm in a different city. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. My children are happy. My wife's happy. Um, yeah, and like, I'm probably the happiest I've ever been in my life. Mm. And it took a lot for me to, you know, to change. Like, it's, I remember a certain point where, I just just got released and I, was, and I sat down and I had nothing. I had everything taken off me, everything I worked for. Like, I mean, I, I had a lot, a lot of money and I improved all my, my tax bills, which I paid. And obviously they were trying to say that it's from ill-gotten gains, but it's not like there's, there's my tax returns, my receipts. I provided everything from, but I still haven't given my stuff back. Mm-hmm. They took everything off me, I had nothing. My bank accounts were froze. Like, I literally... you got a lot of power, mate, with that, haven't they? Yeah. you got a lot, a lot of power if it's uh, through... If they think it's even through or gotten gains. One of my friends, dads, when we were quite well-known in Plymouth when we were growing up, he got everything taken off him when he got busted. Everything. Fucking millions, mate. Lamborghini, the lot. You know, and that that was, you know, definitely from ill gotten gains, but he also had a successful business along the side. And they just take everything. They, were, they, they did. And there was at a point where I was at my house... <laughs> And um, I had no electricity because I had no money. Yeah. So I sat in the dark. The only thing I had was hot water and gravy. And I, I was that broke. I drank gravy for four days. Nice. And yeah, I had to go to the fucking local pub to go and charge my phone. Mm. And yeah, it was a dark, dark time. And then something that always resonates with me now, like my, my wife rang me and she's like, yeah, it was, this is what really, really changed me. Um, and she's like, you've got, we've lost our son. You've got two beautiful children who adore you and who need you. Um, what does she say now? Um, she said, you are, you're a poor excuse of a man, which I was being at the time, because I, I was just depressed. She goes, poor excuse of a man, you're not a man. You are um, just a boy who's got children. That really woke me up. Hmm. I don't think it was, um, wasn't meant to sound as harsh as it does. Yeah. But like I was acting like a ten, like a ten year old, mm. really really feeling sorry for myself, not doing anything, not doing anything about my situation, and like my I love I love my children mm. to absolute bits, and yeah she was she was right, but yeah. like maybe if she didn't put it as bluntly as she did, like I'd be like yeah, fuck off whatever, 
but I wasn't being what I should have been. No, but mate, how much of that, like, it sounds like you kind of went into, like, you know, a little bit of self-destruction, perhaps, yeah, or mentally yeah. at least. Yeah. Like, so much of that must have still been resignating from obviously what happened with Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, because, right? yeah. So I hadn't, um, I, made, I made a decision when I, when, I, when I moved down here just to be a completely different person. Like I got a good job, which I did really well. Got a good contract with a very, very well-respected business, um, building contractors. Um, and that's just out of nothing. I mean, I live, I've got a nice place to live down here. So my family come up every other week and I go down there every other week. Um, but I made a decision to change myself, go back to the gym, so, you know, Google gyms, blah, blah, blah. Found this, obviously, found out, found out our gym. And yeah, um, I wasn't welcomed with with open arms, let's say, because I walked in with a renegade hoodie on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, um, no, I mean, no, I mean, I love Steve. Uh, I love Steve, Sam, and Frank are great coaches. It's great there, and all. Mate, you've got some of the best coaches in the country mate and how fucking good is that gym as well just there's nothing else like it is there mate for like facility, it's like it's like you know like the ones you see in America you know like the big yeah. Yeah, it's like that yeah. and like, where else can you go to see that I mean it's like the gym facility is one part of renegades do you know what I mean that's a that's your well class gym yeah yeah and I think I think give it time I think especially with like Sam and Frank and what we're building there million percent I think it's going to be unbelievable mate I mean I think uh, it was um, yeah it was it wasn't um wasn't I wouldn't say not well not not welcoming but it was kind of a I think as one of the lads at the time was fighting was um, I won't say his name was fighting another lad from the gym so from from Renegade was fighting someone from Flow right okay so so he's he's come out and he's told everyone that I'm a spy I'm like mm. <laughs> <laughs> fuck off I'm like mate I'm like mate you're not you're not you're not, you're not Conor McGregor fighting you know, someone else you're like, I don't even you know, know who you fucking are mate. exactly <laughs> I, I, I didn't even know you I didn't even know who it was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're a, you're a spy. I'm like, fucking hell, mate. Go, yeah. I've come here to train. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, when I um, yeah, and it's gone from there, mate. And that, mm. well, I I say no, no, I don't drink. Like, I would, I would, I'd have a drink on you know, occasion. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs. Have them for a very, very long time. Yeah, you've lost a bit of weight, mate. As well, you're looking good. Yeah, you're looking good from when I first seen you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. It's coming out, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. no, it's great. Yeah. Looking real good. But no, like yeah, it's just um. It just uh, it shows that you know happiness and actually putting your mind to something and sticking to it for more than you know four three four months. Yeah. Uh, it's been well over a year now, mm. and um, yeah, it's but like it's it's um, it really works for me the mm. gym does, and uh, it works for a lot of people. I think it's a big thing to get into. Yeah. And I think it's definitely, uh, definitely a positive impact in my life. Like it's, yeah. I have to, you know, like I, I generally don't miss days when I'm down there mm-hmm. because and I have to have my routine. Mm-hmm. It's not saying I, I, I'd self-destruct if I didn't, but you know, like I like to follow my routine. I'm setting that and I like to stick to my goals and my goal is to, you know, mm-hmm. fight again pretty soon. I'd like to anyway. I feel, I feel now like everyone I fought, like I'm potentially pretty much anyone I'd, I'd absolutely destroy because I perform well every time I spar. I'm fit. Like, I would take some of those classes on Monday and Wednesday, mate. I get through them. And then, yeah, they look fucking brutal. <laughs> they brutal at the time, but you feel wicked after. Yeah. Like when I, when I came, I couldn't do four push ups. I, I did 15 in a row the other day. Yeah, like, that's class. And then I, I could do 18, 18 pull up or chin ups. Like, I couldn't do one. Uh, it's progress, eating correctly, mm. consistency, and just generally being happy in yourself. Because for the first time, probably in a long time, I love love life. Mm-hmm. And there's, uh, I've, I think it's like, like a bit corny, but like, you know, do a bit of meditation, and just sit and think and just like, you know, take the world around you. Some people might say it's bullshit, some might say not, but if it works for you, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But it does for me. And like, I kind know of how to, how to had to drastically change to become the person that I know I should have been yeah. and I feel that like I'm that person and I'm proud yeah amazing mate yeah yeah full circle man yeah like thinking back like for all of everything we've just discussed like the childhoods obviously you know the early MMA days Roman you know and all the recent stuff like if you had to summarise like what you've learnt and what you've taken away from all those lessons yeah. what would it be <laughs> don't be a dick <laughs> <laughs> no it's um, you know um, actually maybe a bit of advice is 
like going through, as I say, like going through things like that. I mean, you're a kid getting beaten up, like or abused, be it sexually, physically. Speak up about it. But my main one would be think before you act. Not really, like really think about it. Like because people don't think about it. Like oh, oh, don't do that, mate. You know, or oh, fuck, what's worse going to happen? Yeah, the worst can happen. Mm. Yeah, think before you act. Yeah, mate. Thank you for sharing, mate. Thank you, mate. Thank, thank you, you mate. Nobody appreciate it.